excited today um, because we are going to be talking about how to become a world-class communicator and negotiate successfully with everyone. Um, and joining us today, we have keynote speaker and best-selling author of Order Out of Chaos, Win Every Negotiation, Thrive in Adversity, and Become a World-Class Communicator, Scott Walker. Thank you, Scott, for joining us today. Hi, Paul. So good to see you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we're going to start out with, um, you know, Scott, if you could tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. Um, well, when I was a, a careers conversation at school, they said you want to be a train driver or, a, I don't know, a plumber or something. Never did they say, do you want to be a, a kidnap negotiator? So I kind of fell into it, so to speak. Uh, I was a police officer. I was a career detective for 16 years at Scotland Yard. And I had, you know, just the best career. I loved every minute, everything from dealing with organized crime and counterterrorism. And in the last few years was uh, getting involved in kidnap for ransom uh, operations. Um, and then I left the police and went to work for the United Nations for a short while. And then before joining a, a boutique consultancy firm in the, heart, in the heart of the city of London that specialized in Kidnap for ransom, uh, cyber extortion, and other uh, crisis response to similar peril types, piracy, et cetera, around the world. Wow. I mean, your background is really, it's just something out of the movie. <laughs> it's something that you don't really come across very often. Uh, and, you know, it seems like the world of Scotland Yard and life or death hostage situations are just so far removed from the executive workplace. Um, but in your book, Order Out of Chaos, you explain that those learnings can be applicable to other settings. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about why you think your pioneering negotiation techniques can translate so well into the corporate world? Well, you've got to remember that kidnappers are just businessmen trying to get the best deal. OK, and probably with that aside, about 80 percent of my time on a case would be spent managing the client managing my own side. We used to call it the crisis within the crisis. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine, just like in everyday business settings, in a, in a situation I was in a kidnap negotiation, on my own side, there'll be internal politics, competing egos, silo thinking, uh, competing demands, unpredictability and uncertainty. And my job was ultimately to bring a sense of calm, objectivity, rational thinking as much as possible and bring order out of chaos. It was really just to kind of reduce those high emotions, the high stress, and so actually better decisions could be made. And so I noticed over the years and all of the cases, there's so many crossovers from managing and handling the client, whether or not that was the family or the corporate crisis management team, there were lots of themes and patterns that showed up regardless of where I was operating around the world, whichever industry or sector. And because of those crossovers, I thought, you know what, this, this is relevant to not just the professional world, but also to our personal everyday lives as well. Wow, yeah, I mean, that you know really makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Every negotiation has some chaos in, involved in it, regardless of how big or small. Um, we like to actually ask our audience a poll question and um, ask them what they see as some of the main challenges when they are negotiating. And uh, we'd love to get your feedback um, based on what the audience thinks. So sure. we're going to ask everybody to answer our poll question. So Bailey, if you could put up the poll for everybody. Um, and this poll is, what do you identify as your main challenge when negotiating, um, and there's a few choices here, um, understanding how to prepare in advance, working past non-negotiables, managing high emotion situations, getting a sas satisfactory end result for all, lack of confidence for managing difficult individuals. So we'd like to ask everybody to pick one of those choices. And we're seeing uh, answers come into the chat here.
lots of stuff like, on um, <laughs> high emotion and non-negotiables. Yeah, um, we're getting a lot on uh, high emotions. Working past non-negotiables is coming up too. Well, I'm sure we'll, we'll I, I'll be able to talk to um, all all the options there. And I'm sure if there's Q&A at the end, we can, we can cover those off if need be. But you want me to talk to about the the high emotions and the non-negotiables yeah, or, or yeah. You just been there managing your boss <laughs> <laughs> yeah well here's the thing on every imagine on a kidnapping case there's going to be um some unreasonable demands made by the kidnappers um and as part of the preparation i would always get the client uh, and you can do this in business as well, is to do what's called a bunch of fives, okay? Mm -hmm. Bunch of fives, imagine the palm of your hand. There's five top five challenges, threats, issues, problems, obstacles, questions, things that are either the other side are going to throw against you, or they're going to levy against you, they're going to get in the way. And also maybe what are your top five um, key considerations now are these non-negotiables for you or for the other side and often objections are usually just unanswered questions because we, we've rushed too quickly to problem solve and we've not spent the time to really understand what is the underlying motivation the underlying needs the core interests that are driving the cat your counterparts uh, decision making and emotions and thought process and these would be things like um, ego is a classic one uh, respect power control identity significance all of these things that lie below the surface unless we can kind of identify and deal with those they can bring about resentment and some really bad deals so first of all you have to work out okay what are the non-negotiables for me and I'm sure a lot of people on this call would have done some previous negotiation training and would have come across concepts like BATNA, you know, best alternative to negotiated agreement, et cetera. And I'm here to kind of say, well, but it doesn't always work that way. Mm -hmm. And just the very idea that you can separate the person from the problem is just unreasonable and it's not possible because we're emotional creatures that make decisions emotionally and then look to rationalize them afterwards. And so, which is why it's important as part of the preparation to really understand what's driving you and your side and what's going to be driving the other side. And there's never been a, a demand from a kidnapper that I've ever, I've ever agreed to. You know, they say, for argument's sake, I want a million dollars and a fully fueled plane out of the country. They're not going to get either of those. Uh -huh. And so we can kind of, talk through those as long as we're comfortable in our in our own position and crucially this is this is the key takeaway of that point um and people may want to write this down is you want to get to the stage where you make the other side feel seen heard and understood that you demonstrate your understanding of their position and this is particularly powerful if you disagree, if there's a gap for where you are, where you both are, where you both want to be. Because if I can demonstrate an understanding and then you can go call cool Sim and say, actually, you know what? Scott really gets me. He understands our perspective, our challenges, our issues, even if I'm not going to pay you more money mm -hmm. or pay you less money, whatever it is. So that's really the non-negotiables. And from the high emotion, mm -hmm. as I said, we're emotional creatures that think, not thinking creatures that feel. So it drives all behavior. And by understanding the emotions that are driving you and the other side will enable you to succeed in a negotiation. And if you don't do that, they could quite easily derail it as well. Do you think um, part of that is also understanding their motivations behind what they're asking for? 100%, that's exactly what it is. Because if I'm sensing frustration, or mm -hmm. anger or impatience in you in a negotiation. And first of all, let's just take a little segue. People overcomplicate what a negotiation is. It's simply a conversation with a purpose. 
that you are looking to bring about some form of cooperation or collaboration. End of. Intention matters. And that's where we want to end up, ideally. Um, so hopefully that kind of clarifies that bit. Um, and, and just going back in terms of understanding the motivation is the only way we can really do that mm -hmm. is by truly listening to what the other side is saying and not saying. And I call it level five listening. All right. Imagine. And I talk about this in quite a lot of detail in the book, but just in terms of a really quick overview, level one, level two will be you're listening for the gist. You know, maybe I've just kind of got one ear on what you're saying, but I'm actually waiting for my Amazon delivery or worrying about what I've got on next in the day. Or I'm just waiting so you can stop talking and so I can then give you my perspective and tell you why I'm right and you're wrong. And so we work our way through those different levels to listening for emotion. And eventually we want to get to level five, which is I want to listen for your point of view, your beliefs, your values, your rules, your, your map of the world. Your, how do you interpret life? And people think, oh, blimey, Scott, that's a lot. It, it's not. You're probably already doing it. But if you can kind of suspend your own thinking, so to speak, Remember, it's about seeking first to understand before being understood. And you truly listen for, you're listening for what's not being said. You're listening for the, the space in between the words. You're listening for the incongruency, the mismatch between words, tone, body language, if you're face to face. And the other side, the counterpart, they will give you, they will tell you, even without realizing it, what their needs are, their desires, their pain points. And then if you're truly listening and you're coming with a good intent, you can help them get what they want. And by doing so, you'll get what you want as well. Interesting. That's really interesting. I want to take a step back a little bit because in your book, you mentioned that in order to become a world-class communicator and a top negotiator, one must establish a red center and master our mindset. Um, can you tell us a little bit how you define a red center and why it's connecting with our red center, the first thing we should do? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that's kind of day one, week one um, kind of aspect, <laughs> really. Okay, the red center in, in law enforcement terms, it was the physical location where the conversation, the negotiation, the phone calls between us, the family, the, the corporate organization and the kidnappers took place. So that could be a kitchen table, a kitchen in the family home. It could be a boardroom. It could be a room in an embassy somewhere. <clears throat> and initially it's a place full of uncertainty, high emotions and drama, lot, lots of activity. But then gradually, and again, my job was to make it the calmest place on the planet. The place where no matter what happened, and imagine a kidnap negotiation, it's the most unregulated, ungoverned, dangerous industry in the world. If you, if it can go wrong, it will. It was bringing about a sense of calm, grounded centeredness that no matter what happened, we were going to find a way through. Mm -hmm. And then over the cases and over the years, you know, 10, 15 years of doing this, it, it didn't matter where I was in the world. There were certain themes and patterns, regardless of industry or sector, that I could see, as I said earlier. And I realized, actually, this is more than just a physical location. It's, it's, a, it's something within all of us. It's an ability. It's um, a place that we can go into, we can tap into ourselves. When we're getting stressed, we're having a really difficult conversation, or we're, we're about to get hit by the tsunami of overwhelm and competing demands. It's that moment where we pause, we take a breath, and we can tune into ourselves about what's going on, ground ourselves, buy ourselves time. And you could just, you might just only be able to manage a split second. But that split second gap, that pause, that you take control of amidst all the chaos going around on around you, that enables you to consciously choose how you're going to respond rather than engaging in a knee-jerk emotive reaction. 
and I'm sure I'm not the only one on this call that has said or done something that later regret, you know, you press send or you mm -hmm. say those words that you can't take back. That's usually in that moment, immediately after the trigger or the overwhelm. And so well, that red center, if we can tap into it, enables us to bring some calmness and, and buy us time to respond consciously rather than react emotionally. Is there, um, just out of curiosity, any techniques or things you said, take a deep breath or anything that you would recommend for people to kind of bring themselves to that state? Yeah, again, I discovered this the hard way. I got it wrong so many times in the early days. Uh, neither went wrong. I mean, bear in mind, if it goes wrong in a kidnapping, people can, can die. So it focuses the mind on what works and what doesn't. So I learned this the hard way and it works for me. I offer it for people on this call and adapt it to, to, see, to see what works for you. I call it the immediate action drill, the IA drill. And it's a little three-step process. You can keep in your back pocket. You can print it out. You can take a screenshot in the book. There's a the diagram in there. And I just keep, even now, I still keep it in, in, my, in my journal, my, my, my notebook. First one is, step one is interrupt the pattern. And what I mean by that is you get that trigger, you get that overwhelm, you get that stimulus. And it's very easy to get tunnel vision, to get focused, to start spiraling downward into a negative story, a disempowering place where we look to blame and shame other people or the situation. But interrupting that pattern could be something as simple as you, if you sat down, you stand up and you go outside or you go and take a couple of breaths, or you go and do some jumping jacks in the corner, if that's your thing, whatever. But it's about stopping you spiraling any further. Once you've done that, the second stage is any skiers or surfers here will know this around, it's about just riding that wave or riding or, or, or carving down the slope. Riding the wave is the second step. And what I mean by that is when you get that trigger, your body uh, pushes out uh, about 90 seconds worth of cortisol and adrenaline. And you can't really do anything about that. That's just an emotive, hardwired, fight or flight reaction that we get. And it's pumping around our body. And that's the time when we're going to do or say something we'll later regret. So you interrupt the pattern. You want to just feel the feeling in your body, ride the wave, but drop the story as to why you're feeling it okay so step one is interrupt the pattern step two is ride the wave feel the feeling but drop the story as much as you want to blame that person blame the situation or circumstances it ain't going to help you in that moment then 90 seconds two minutes it may take 10 minutes 20 minutes to start with but gradually you want to bring that down to 90 seconds with practice you can then move on to the third and final step when you're regulated and here's the thing emotional self-regulation is the number one skill of the world's best negotiators okay and so when you balance yourself out you can't step three is ask better questions mm -hmm.